So good afternoon, everyone. Good. And welcome uh, to uh, back to the afternoon session of this amazing uh, conference. It's been just fantastic. If you've been here yesterday uh, for the events or this morning, um, we had some amazing workshops, a great plenary, a, a fantastic uh, uh, documentary. It's just been amazing and wonderful. And now we're, you know, we're post lunch. And so, you know, sometimes in these little rooms like this one, especially if it's dark, um, and in feeling really cozy, um, we can get, get just a little sleepy. And so I would invite you as we go on today, um, just to go ahead and do what you need to do. If you need to grab a glass of water, if you need to stand up or whatever, please just do whatever you need to do because you're, you, you you're in for an amazing treat with these panelists here today. So I want to welcome you to the Emancipation in Florida Testimonials, Tradition and Strategies, a workshop of the Journey of, uh, to Emancipation Statewide Conference. I'm Kathleen Spihar, Executive Director of the Council on culture and arts so welcome to our city and county if you are from outside our city and county and I wanted to let you know that um, I lead the local arts or organization here that supports arts culture history and heritage in this capital city region it's a great honor and an amazing privilege to be here moderating this conversations with this panel this rock star panel of preservationists and mu museum experts from around the state so our topic, Emancipation in Florida, Testimonials, Traditions, and Strategies, is as follows. Um, and here's the description. Um, in view of the declaration of Juneteenth as a national emancipation holiday, while holding to the Day of Freedom history and culture from other states, including Florida on May 20th, 1865, Preservationists and music museum leaders will showcase May 20th, 2021 and earlier events held in their communities to preserve the history that has brought freedom to over 100,000 enslaved persons in Florida. So if you, um, if you're, if, if this isn't where you wanted to be right now, um, you should stay, but in case it isn't, um, we, ha we do have a uh, host here, Robin Rhyme, um, who um, is our room host and she can um, get you to the right place. So uh, before I, I go on and introduce the panel, I do have a few housekeeping items to review with you. And the first thing um, is that this en event is being recorded for rebroadcasting. Um, another one is each panelist will share about you know, 10, 12 minutes and will uh, take questions um, from the audience at the very end after the last panelist has presented. Um, if you're interested in, um, in asking a question, we have to use microphones. So um, I'm using this microphone right here. All the panelists will be speaking into a microphone. So if you do want to ask a question, I will be bringing the microphone to you and you can go ahead and ask, ask your question. And just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll go ahead and, and get that done and you can share your question or your comment. Um, if you uh, need anything, again, Robin is here to help you. Um, and. Um, I wanted to also have a, another um, announcement from the, uh, the conference itself, and that's in your conference program. So this is for tonight after we get done talking today. It's on page 24 of your uh, guide, um, and there are two sessions that are listed from 6 to 8 p.m. So session number one, uh, which is legacies, communities, and, ha and, and hair property rights, that one is going to be, there's no changes in that uh, session. Um, in the session number two, which is the Florida Maroon Societies, Gola Gichi and the, you know, the Underground Railroad, that is, the location has been changed to the park view. So the park view is where lunch was, the plenary, the documentary. So it's just, you have, just have to go outside the door and go back in the other side of the hotel. So um, Robin or I can help you find that if it is need be, okay? So that's the other um, announcement I have for today. So now that that's done, um, we're going to go on for introductions of our esteemed panel. So I'm going to start over here on our right. So we have Vivian, Vivian Filer, who is the founding, the founding chair um, and a board member of the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center in Gainesville. Next to Vivian, we have Regina Gale Phillips, who is the director of the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center and African American History Center in St. Augustine. And next to Regina is Charlene Farrington, who is the executive director of the Spady Cultural Heritage Museum in Delray, Florida. And then next to Charlene is Harriet Myers, who is the officer treasurer of the Lee County Black History Society in Fort Myers. And then going to the other side of the room here, we've got Tim Barber, who is the executive director of the Black Archives History and Research Foundation of South Florida. 
Next to Tim, we have our storyteller from this morning who's been really amazing, Danny Sylvester, who is the historic preservationist from Jackson, Jackson County. And then next to Danny, we have Sandra Rook, author of three books on African-American history and culture in Pinellas County, an English teacher and co-founder of the Pinellas County African-American History Museum. And then to round us out, we have got Mary Allen, who is the executive director of the African-American Museum of the Arts. So it's amazing, um, the panelists that we have here today, and we can't wait to hear what emancipation events you have to share. So we're gonna start down here with Vivian, and we're gonna, gonna, gonna move down the line, and, um, and if you, again, as, as you share, please let us know more about yourself, too, since um, all of you have got amazing resumes that I, I can't uh, fill everybody in on at this time. So, so we're gonna start over here with Vivian now, and you're gonna go ahead and kick us off. So Thank thanks, you. everybody. Thank you, my name is Vivian Filer, as she said, and I'm from Gainesville, Florida. I don't know if you know of that city, but it's the home of the fighting gators. I try not to say that too often. But anyway, it is Gainesville. Uh, I am chair, founder, CEO, all of those things of the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center, mostly because we're only three years old. And as soon as I find some young person that I can put in all of those positions except founder, I will definitely do that. But right now, since we all are all volunteers in my board, I have a council, I have very active uh, people in the community that support us, and of course, Poppin, who keeps, is the wind beneath our wings. We, my center is a building that is historic in its own right because it was built by the soldiers in World War II at Camp Landing, Florida in, uh, in the 40s, early 40s. Used as a PX on that site, later moved to Gainesville, became a theater for African Americans, then a big bands club, and was named for the big band club in Harlem, the Cotton Club. And therefore, James Brown, B.B. King, Brooke Benton, Bo Diddley, all of them played on, on the stage at this center in the, in the Ch Chitlin Circuit days. So we're a site on the Chitlin Circuit. We preserve the building, and we're ever so proud of it. But I'm here today to talk to you about how the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center is involved in the celebration of Emancipation Proclamation. That involvement has been going on for some time and we have, as others have, uh, celebrated Juneteenth. And even though I celebrated May 20th as a child, that all was erased out of my mind, and we were celebrating June 19th, as we will continue to do. But right now, I have learned and am trying to make sure, along with the board, that we emphasize May 20th as Florida's Day. We're very happy with that. We're very comfortable with that. When we were asked to be a part of the Gainesville celebration of Juneteenth, the committee chair asked if I would serve as a community member on that committee. And I shared with her I would be happy to do so only if we recognize May 20th as Florida's Emancipation Day because that is what we are fighting for in, in, in our um, mission and goals. So uh, having done so, this is February of 2021. The founder, the chairperson of the committee decided to come up with the um, theme, Journey to Juneteenth, which meant that we were gonna have a month-long celebration, starting with May 20th as the initial kickoff day, and that day became the day that the Cotton Club Museum and Culture Center was going to take over. So you see now we're, we are Journey to Juneteenth, May 20th to June 19th. Next slide. I guess I'm gonna tell you next slide. I'm gonna have to do next slide too, huh? <laughs> okay, I'm not used to doing this, you guys. <laughs> so here we are, Journey to June theme, the month long celebration. You see all of the, uh, at the very bottom of the slide, the Cotton Club Museum, the Gainesville Black Professionals, Nathan Ross uh, Mama's Club is a, is a a public service sort of thing. They help neighborhoods, the Matheson Museum, and all of those listed there were people who took part in that month-long celebration. It was truly wonderful. A little bit of everything was done. Next slide, please. So the next thing then that we were able to do in this celebration was to look at where we were 
in terms of uh, the beginning. So May 20th, you see the gentleman in the middle raising the Juneteenth flag. At the bottom, you see the mayor uh, in one corner. He's having, uh, making the speech for that initial May 20th, recognizing that day, and talking about the journey as we lifted the flag in the middle. And then I spoke directly to the May 20th celebration. We also had a resolution to that effect, which the mayor read. We haven't had a proclamation. It says something I want to work on, but right now that's where we are. Uh, with that. They also came up with their own uh, logo, which you see at the top of the page there with their journey to Juneteenth. During the month-long celebration, uh, Court Nathaniel Courtney chaired several events that were virtual, but they dealt with issues, thank you, they dealt with issues that had to do with our struggle, uh, a beautiful struggle. I brought in the whole context just before enslaved people are doing the initial time enslaved people were brought in. And then over the course of his series, they covered quite a few things. Dr. Zahara Simmons that you see down at the bottom, she's actually an original member of SNCC. Uh, so uh, she had taught at university, now she's retired. She was very, very good uh, in that celebration. Next slide. So the next slide you'll see that there was a, a high school racial justice essay contest that with the, kid, the children did a really good job with that. And uh, so, of course, there was a winner of that contest. The, the artist that is um, up to the right there has been an artist for a long time. She's 72, and her, artist has to, her, her artistic work has to do with uh, religion and, and the things that she has portrayed over the years. She actually has a piece in the Smithsonian, I believe, as well. But I won't go over every page in this length, in this depth, but I do want to let you know that there's a uh, black uh, business professional uh, magazine there called Synergy. And you'll see some of the women, the three that are off to the side there near Synergy, were featured in this magazine. They featured 50 women, really outstanding black women, over all spectrum of the professional world, educational world, and all in this, it was just really very well done. So you see uh, that there, and then other aspects of the, of the, of our culture and our ethnic group and the things that we are prolific in were highlighted over the months. Next slide. So here we are. There was a freedom walk. You'll see that in the uh, the, set, the picture at the bottom. This was a newscast that a news reviewer came out and interviewed that. After each event during the month. Uh, they basically were on weekends, even though some of them were Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night events that were virtual and other things. These were also carried on the news pre-event uh, and post-event, quite a large amount of coverage for those events. So I thought it was very well handled. And each time that I had an opportunity to, to speak, I always tried to tie in the relevance of the two. Not that Juneteenth doesn't need to be celebrated. I think any time, any date, that anybody was set free in this country needs to be celebrated. It's just that they each take on different connotations of celebration. And I wanted this time to be uh, uh, a time that we begin to realize that it's not just June 19. So uh, I think we were able to say that a lot. I'll have the next slide. And as we did so, uh, I got a lot of, oh, I never heard that before. Oh, I didn't know a thing about that. Or, oh, that's good information. And I was glad to share that. Uh, uh, with everyone. At the very bottom, the large picture, we were a part of that uh, city, that um, uh, stretching toward freedom event that uh, was done by the Rally House. At the top, with all the red and white, that's not Delta, even though I do appreciate any Deltas in the room, I'll just move on. Anyway, <laughs> Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln High School's color is red and white, and that's where I went to high school. They were celebrating their 50th year anniversary. Actually, the school was closed in 1970, and these poor kids had to go over to the white school in the middle of the year. So they never graduated from their high school, as did a lot of them. I'm in with them, but I'm way older than they are. But they, they ask, ask all the alumni to come in with that. When we uh, reached the point of celebrating Juneteenth, which the Cotton Club Museum was still in charge <coughs> of, we did so by celebrating Black Music Month, because Black Music Month is June. 
And therefore, we tied the two together. We'd already emphasized May 20th, and we wanted to make sure we put some emphasis <coughs> on black music as well as Juneteenth. So we will continue to do that uh, as we go along because uh, it's in the works, and that's what people expect. I'll have the next slide, if you don't mind. So this is just the overall calendar of uh, Florida's Emancipation Day that was the day assigned to uh, us and our program was virtual. We were very, very happy to have with us uh, the mayor that day. Actually, I put together a little video. Uh, we read the Emancipation Proclamation. I had a former commissioner to read that a portion of it and uh, uh, the mayor to read a portion of it and then another gentleman on my board to read a portion. We intertwined that with newspaper articles with some of the pictures that were related to the dates and the times and the cities, and I had a board member to do that. We put all of this together along with music from A Thousand Voices, which is a very good uh, singing group in our area. Next slide. And of course, there you see Jarvis Rozier and uh, uh, Clifford, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, who are excellent. <laughs> Need I say more? I think we all know that. I'll have the next slide, too, please. So, uh, see, I'm just showing the media coverage there. Uh, we were able to get uh, a little bit of everything on. The city carried the entire calendar on their website. Uh, it was available through the media on some of their websites. We, of course, carried it on the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center's website. And as I said, the newspaper articles as well as the magazine highlighted the month. So before the month was over, Quite a few people were touched by the uh, expansive way that uh, Juneteenth had been celebrated, uh, May 20th up to Juneteenth had been celebrated. And that was my uh, design today, to teach you and show you what we did through the month. Uh, I hope you were able to take something away. There is still more behind that, but it is a 10 minute video and it covers the media, the pre and post uh, events that were carried. I'm not going to take you through that. I have it available if while you're here, you would like to uh, see it, I would be very happy to share it. Thank you for this opportunity to present, and I look forward to seeing the rest of you. Bye. Fantastic, great way to, to kick us off, Vivian. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is going to be Regina Gale Phillips. Hello, and thank you for coming this afternoon. My name is Regina Gale Phillips. I'm with the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. And while we're waiting for that to come up, what I'm gonna show you today is actually parts of an exhibit that we did virtually this past January. Lincolnville is a little unique in that we have celebrated emancipation since 1863, January 1st. And um, the first uh, commemorative celebration was January 1st, 1864. And it continued on up until the time of Jim Crow when it kind of went underground a little bit. So I'm gonna go through a lot of this and share it with you. We, we titled this Watch Night because that's something that we still do. Um, it's a part of the Gullah Geechee culture because South Carolina was also one of those areas that were occupied, that was occupied by the uh, Union soldiers where they were actually watching for the reading, for the soldier to come to, through with the uh, word that the proclamation had been signed. So I failed to bring my flesh drive back, so I'm gonna have to look at the screen a little bit. <laughs> so. Uh, I thought I was making my load a little lighter, but uh, anyway. So um, can we go to the next slide? Um, that's just an overview. What we did in this past year was a year-long program with a number of other museums, not all African-American museums, but museums in, in St. Augustine. We have a curators uh, association, and so we came together and designed a program that's called 450 Years of uh, African American Presence called Resilience Program. So we put together a calendar and then each museum took turns uh, posting things year round, different events, 
And we kicked it off with our watch night program that um, is the one that um, I'm gonna show you excerpts from. But this is a program that is actually culminating this coming February. And we've done a variety of different things um, through that program to educate people about the African-American history of our area. This is a map of Lincolnville. Um, for anybody who doesn't know where Lincolnville is, it is one of the uh, Freedmen, um, it wasn't even a town, it's just a section of St. Augustine. It was um, like Ward 5 is I think what it was called, or District 5, where the majority of black people lived post-Civil War. Prior to the Civil War, blacks lived all over the city. It was really uh, grew more after um, emancipation than um, it had been before because there were free blacks living in St. Augustine for a very long time. And that's another whole story for another day. But uh, if you could go to the next slide. This Lincolnville Historic District is what I'm talking about. So a lot of the things that you're gonna see took place in that area. It's an area where US colored troops coming back from the Civil War settled. As early as 1866, they built home sites in what had formerly been an orange plantation because they didn't grow cotton in St. Augustine. They grew oranges and they grew indigo um, and they grew corn and they still grow corn and potatoes. So, um, but that was a part of the heritage of East Florida. And so since 1991, Lincolnville has been designated as a National Historic District. And that gives you a little bit of background about that. You can move on. Uh, in our program, we started out with the emancipation just to tell people what it was, how we got to that, and we can move on. I'm not gonna labor on any of that. This was kind of like a promo to show that you know, blacks were actually recruited to join the war even before the emancipation was official. And um, so we can move on. Um, this is a, a, a piece, an illustration that we show as part of our permanent emancipation exhibit that is in our museum because it is a, a, an integral part of our history and we wanna make sure that we tell that a part of our story. Uh, it, it has this with uh, explainers of all the things that were in there as well as a list of all the um, Reconstruction era uh, black elected officials in the years and the um, places where they served within our community. Not all of them were from St. Augustine because people moved around and so we had people who moved from Georgia and the Carolinas to St. Augustine or from Nassau County to be, be and they became elected officials during that time period. We can move on. Florida, which I'm not sure how many people know that, was actually East Florida and West Florida. So St. Augustine was East Florida. St. John's County was that whole part you see on the right side. And Escambia County was the whole part that you see on the left side in the Panhandle area. And so um, when we talk about St. John's County, historically, it's a little different from what we know today because um, you know half of the state is what would have been part of St. John's County at that time. And Tallahassee ended up being this place in the middle because West Florida and East Florida couldn't agree that either they had a rough time going over land or a rough time going all the way around the um, point of Florida to get to a place in the middle where they could have their meetings after it became a, a British territory and a, and a state. So they decided on Tallahassee. That's how we get Tallahassee as the capital of Florida. This is a little bit of a abbreviated timeline of emancipation, um, the first reading. We do have evidence that it was read first in St. Augustine as one of those original places in the fall of 1862. And um, in more than one place, we have it uh, documented through uh, other historical documents. And then on January 1st, we had, um, January 1st was, uh, oh, this is the um, leading up to the Civil War. Okay, so um, in January of 1861 is when the Confederates came to St. Augustine, or they decided that St. Augustine decided that it would become a part of the secession from the state of Florida. It's hard to do it without seeing it. <laughs> and um, anyway, they occupied the state without a single bullet being fired. They um, came and they took over Fort Castile because that was the seat of government at that point in time. The forts, we look at them as tourist places now, but they were actually fortified cities that were, that's where the government was at, at that point in time. 
So the Confederates took over and then they gave it up after about 13 months when they heard that the Union soldiers were coming in through Fernandina at um, Port Mills, which is now known as Mayport, where we have a big naval um, base there. I should also tell you that there were several blacks who were part of the Navy. We don't talk about the Navy a lot, but there were more Navy officers than um, before there were Army officers. And they patrolled the St. John's River coming from Mayport, coming all the way down through, um, uh, down to um, the Palatka area. And they were able to do quite a bit of, of work during the Civil War. And we have a lot of those documents in our historical records as well. But by March of 1862, the Union soldiers did come in and they um, retook St. Augustine. And the St. Augustine is interesting based on what we were talking this morning about who tells the story of history. So the St. Augustine history says that the uh, northern invaders came in in March of 1862 and took over. You know, so that tells you the perspective of you know, what the city was like. But there was great division. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I didn't share this this morning, but a man by the name of Buckingham Smith actually wrote to the secretary, um, Secretary Stewart, to talk about how um, the um, the uh, Confederates were kind of taking over the town and, and causing this, you know, uh, upheaval and asked for federal troops to come in. And so we think that's part of how federal troops came to St. Augustine so early because they had that support there. And that's another uh, long story about one of my other favorite museum stories about one man who was an African who was a part of the Buckingham Smith household. He becomes one of those first generation registered voters in St. Augustine in 1866, and it shows us his place, place of birth as <coughs> Africa. So um, that's a sidebar story. <laughs> I'm loaded with them. Sure. <laughs> but anyway, I want to go on. And if, so by January 1st of tw um, 1863, we did have uh, watch night services and emancipation um, celebrations in our plaza. It was actually read there, and it was celebrated from that moment going forward. And also, we know that in um, 1865, that Tallahassee, um, it was read here at the Knot House. Oh, I can move on. Yeah, I'll come over so I can see what you're seeing. Because. So we're just going to pause for a second just to get Regina. Yeah, we're going to get Regina set up with a different microphone. Okay, I'm sorry. That's fine, I'll stand back here. So um, this was actually um, from the government house in St. Augustine, because this is Union soldiers there on December 13, 1862. They were in force. There were also African American soldiers that were there that came from Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. So we have in our museum documents from the um, Smithsonian of photographs of African American troops guarding in St. Augustine as early as 1862. Um, so we can move on. So this is what I was trying to say before. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, we know that the war ended on May 9th, 1865, and then um, General Cook came to St. Tallahassee in May of 1865 and on to um, Texas in June of 1865, which is Juneteenth, which is why we're here talking about the difference between um, May 20th and June 19th. So I'm gonna just say this one more time. We're standout, we're St. Augustine, and we have traditionally celebrated January 1st as Emancipation Day. And we continue to do that only because it's a historical marker for our city that is different only because of the Union occupation there that was not here in Tallahassee at that time. And Tallahassee was still um, occupied by the Confederacy during um, January of 1863. So we don't do any social things, we just do the history when we talk about Emancipation Day. I just want to make that part clear, we can move on. And this is just a, uh, another illustration showing you know, people getting ready for watch night and waiting to hear the word, families that were gathered together in different places. Uh, a lot, I don't know if a lot of you may remember watch night services in churches. And I grew up 
not knowing what it was all about. I thought it was just waiting. First, I thought it was waiting for Jesus to come, and then I thought it was just waiting for the new year. And when I started at the Lincolnville Museum, I found it was waiting to hear the reading of the emancipation. So I've learned a lot. Um, I should tell you, from um, I came to the museum in 2015 as a volunteer, and I have learned so much since that time uh, about the history of St. Augustine. And um, I knew a lot about African American history, but I didn't know much about St. John's County and St. Augustine history. So we can move on to the next slide, please. I don't want to show this because that's a long video, but it's a great video that showed uh, how President uh, Barack Obama took that illustration of photograph and made it. He put it right outside of his Oval Office when he was in the White House to show emancipation. It's really a beautiful uh, presentation done by the White House curator. We can move on. Uh, we can um, move on. I think that's pretty much what we saw before to I think a couple of slides. This is also at the government house. This is what it looked like at the time. So um, these are guards that were stationed there in um, 1864. And this is still in St. Augustine. It's operated by the University of Florida as a museum and, and government center where a lot of records for the state of Florida uh, are still housed. Somebody asked a question in our earlier session about archives. If you want to know about African American history in the state of Florida, outside of the Black Archives, Tim, you need to go to UF or FSU to get a lot of those records because they they collected them and they sat on them. So unless you are searching for them, you're not going to find them just jumping out at you. We can move on. This is our Liberty Bell, and it's not an authentic thing, but it's been there since the early part of the 1900s. And this commemorates the lot where the proclamation was read in St. Augustine. So it's now on a private property, but it, it quotes a woman, Mary Gomez, who had been enslaved, who was telling this story as they were doing slave narratives in the early part of the 1900s. And she shared the story about what happened because she was one of the people that was there the day the proclamation was actually read and how people, their bonds of those uh, who were enslaved, including herself, they were struck off that day. This is a South Carolina picture, but a lot of St. Augustine people were there that day at um, this camp when we had this official reading because they had mustered out even before. We had soldiers that we found that were actually killed in battle before the actual signing of the Declaration, not Declaration, Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so our history is kind of woven in more with um, South Carolina and um, the whole um, story about what happened there because we have people who are buried there and we have people who came back from South Carolina who became a part of St. Augustine history. We can move on. This is an invitation that we found online and it's an invitation to Captain Durgan of the 7th New Hampshire Volunteers to the anniversary of the Proclamation of Emancipation in St. Augustine on January 1st, 1864. So we found a lot of other things in some of the military records of um, the generals. They wrote great ledgers, and you have to read through all the letters that they wrote to get to the juicy parts of the historical tidbits of what you want. But this is one of those things that we found. We can move on. And this is just um, showing, this was actually Charleston uh, Emancipation Day. This was several years later. So it shows that you know, it's something that continued over time. It wasn't just a one off kind of celebration. This is actual in St. Augustine, and this is the Emancipation Committee. This was um, the building you see in the background is part of Florida Normal College that used to be in St. Augustine. We now know it as Florida Memorial College in Miami. Some of the people um, who were seated there included Frank Butler. Get anybody ever hear of Butler Beach in St. Augustine? Mm -hmm. Well, Frank Butler was the chairperson of the uh, Emancipation Committee during that time. And actually, this is a photograph from a book about his, his life that um, we, we used, and that was in the 1920s. Um, a lot of pictures that you're going to see are actually photos from Richard Twine. Richard Twine was a St. Augustine photographer, African-American photographer who captured, he did portrait studios of a lot of people, and we have a lot of those in our museum that tell the story of the people of Lincolnville in an exhibit that's part of our permanent exhibit we call Lincolnville Lifeways. But he also captured pictures like this, and you'll see a few more, with uh, the Emancipation Parade. So the GAR 
that was there on the car of the parade marshal stood for the um, Grand Army of the Republic. And so those were the soldiers that came back. Most blacks um, also, they fought for the Republic and they, as they fought for their freedom. The Army of the Republic was the Republic of America, but they all became Republicans. And I think that's another interesting sidebar is that the Republican Party was the party of freedom. So when people say Abraham Lincoln Republicans, we need to understand what they mean. But by the time we get to the end of Reconstruction, you see it's starting to flip in the other direction because it's the Southern Democrats who fight against Reconstruction. Uh, let's go to the next slide. These are more parade pictures. There are quite a few. And we like to tell people that these pictures are reminiscent of some of the parades that you see of New York City, Harlem Renaissance era, 1920s kind of parades. They were a big deal in, in the St. Augustine community. You can see they decorated everything. And we have a 98-year-old woman who lives in our community still, Mrs. Barbara Vickers, who was instrumental in getting a um, foot soldiers monument in our plaza. She's still with us. And she recounts going as a young girl to um, help decorate some of these floats. And it's just a, a great treasure, because we collect oral histories as well as a part of what we do. And this was a medical float. Some of the doctors and nurses who were a part of it, um, part of the uh, parade exhibits. This was from St. Benedict the Moor Parochial School. And St. Benedict the Moor was the Catholic school that is really a block away from the Excelsior where the Lincolnville uh, Museum is. There was a third school that was there that was called the um, uh, Cooper School, it's actually a, a Presbyterian parochial school. So the three schools were kind of like in a triad. And so the schools all had their own floats as well. This is another float. Um, and a lot of these, we don't have all the names of all of the people. So that's a part of what we've still been working on identifying. Most of these pictures you can find, our local historical society is the custodian of these pictures. But they, uh, some of them are posted on Florida Memories. You can see them in the Twine Collection. And um, you know we printed quite a few that we have put in our exhibits in the museum as well. So these are ladies from the community. This is a float that was put together by um, the African American Life Insurance Company, who was um, A.L. Lewis was the founder, um, also the uh, people who founded American Beach and just to our north. And this was, I think, a parade queen uh, and her court in a, in a different vehicle. So these are some of the people. Um, we can finish with that, and I can just finish to tell you that um, if you go to the next slide so you can see I didn't show my museum. This is the Excelsior High School, and this is where the Lincolnville Museum is. And a lot of the people who went to this school participated in emancipation parades. And then they also participated in civil rights movements in the 1960s. So some of those people and some of their descendants are still there. We are working on restoring this building. We started last year with a $500,000 grant from the National Park Service. And we're applying for new money this year from the Department of State. And hopefully we'll be able to restore it to its grandeur. We have um, tried to incorporate it, the story of emancipation in the context of 450 years of African-American history in the museum. Those are the stories that we tell every day, five days a week, we're open. And so we don't do much with Juneteenth. I can tell you this year is the first time we've ever had a Juneteenth program. Of course, we were excited to hear it was a national holiday as everybody. And we participated in a musical program um, at the amphitheater in St. Augustine along with the St. Augustine Music um, Festival. And uh, we had the Rich Chamber Players, which are fabulous um, classical music uh, singers and musicians. And the last rendition they did was Lift Every Voice and Sing. It was a new arrangement. It was really beautiful. But we haven't done a lot with um, the May 20th date, only because we have stuck to our local history. And that's, we have so many different local stories that are unique to St. Augustine. So that's what we tell. And so, you know, it doesn't mean we're not a part of all the other bigger stories, but that's the history we tell. And, you know, I hope you guys will check us out. We do have an online presence. The presentation that I did and some of the others that we've done 
are online that you can look at in more detail if you want the actual um, virtual um, exhibit, which gives a lot more detail than what I've able, been able to share here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. And so our next speaker is going to be um, uh, Charlene Farrington. So hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for allowing me to come before you and talk a little bit today uh, about uh, emancipation celebrations in Juneteenth. My museum is called Spady Cultural Heritage Museum. It's named after a former educator Solomon David Spady, um, who was born and raised in Virginia and made his way to South Florida, Delray Beach, specifically in the 1920s. Um, so you've been hearing a lot about the different Floridas that we all inhabited. Um, we are in the, the third Florida, the, the southern peninsula, east coast, uh, down near uh, the peninsula. Delray Beach is about 50 miles north of Miami to give you a kind of a perspective of where we are. And while much of what is being talked about was happening, uh, our area was still being settled. Uh, the land had just been revealed and people were coming to the area from other parts. Specifically where we are in Delray Beach, people were immigrating from the Bahamas, they were coming from North Florida, Georgia, Carolina, the basically Gullah Geechee coastline. Um, and then white settlers were coming uh, initially primarily from the Michigan area. So we had a mixed mash of immigrants coming to the area, creating a new way of life, settling in the coastal communities. This is about the 1860s. Um, by the 1890s, uh, emancipation was being celebrated, but it was primarily being done in the churches. Churches and schools, of course, were the first institutions to be established in these newly forming communities. And um, Emancipation Day was celebrated through our churches. Um, by the time we got to the 1940s, um, the churches had sort of uh, stopped uh, as many activities as they did, primarily because you know education is now being handled off-site, no longer within the church. There are separate school buildings, and um, as part of our curriculum in uh, Palm Beach County, emancipation simply was not being taught as much as it was before. Uh, other reasons, uh, schools were slowly, not completely, being desegregated, not integrated, I'm using my words carefully, uh, and the curriculums were changing. Uh, by the 1990s, there was very little recognition of Emancipation Day. When I was coming up, I won't tell you where I fit in in that timeline, um, we celebrated May Day uh, but again, like everyone else, we didn't know what we were celebrating. We knew we got to go outside and have activities. It wasn't really being explained to us what we were recognizing with this um, celebration. Uh, our museum, the Spady Cultural Heritage Museum, was established in 2001. Uh, when it was established, one of the women who was very vocal uh, and instrumental in keeping the recognition of emancipation going in our community shared all of her documentation and information that she had collected over the years when she was rolling out emancipation celebrations through her civic organization, which is, just happened to be a voters league in Delray Beach and she advocated very strongly that somebody within our community need to, needed to continue to recognize emancipation. Our museum in 2010 held its first Emancipation Day event in an attempt to celebrate Emancipation Day. It was poorly attended. Um, the general sentiment was 
what do you mean Emancipation Day? You mean the 4th of July? You know, there, there just was no, no education. No one really knew about this particular um, event. Let me also talk to you a little bit about the demographics of our coastal communities. There are very few African Americans in Delray Beach. Uh, they are Bahamian Amer American, they are Jamaican American, they are Cuban American, they are Dominican American. Um, but when you talk to people, very few, there are very few left who were actually, can trace their legacy back to um, the earlier uh, descendants of the formerly enslaved. A lot of the people in South Florida have come to South Florida from other parts of the world. So there is a, a real, and the coastal communities are primarily tourist areas now. So the rest of the community is made up of people who are transient, who are seasonal, who are just visiting. So there's very little um, cohesiveness in terms of a community that recognizes our culture and our heritage in Florida. So everything that we do, we found that it is an, an educational exercise. So in 2010, we had very low attendance and very few people who knew what we were here for. Why are we here? So what happened in our case is our uh, Board of Governors decided to continue to recognize Juneteenth, but to turn it into a fundraising event for the organization. All right, commercialized it. Um, and so from 2010 until 2018, we were holding Juneteenth events, but there was very little that had to do with the emancipation of people who were formerly enslaved in the US. Um, I was promoted to executive director in 2018. And in 2018, I made the decision to turn that event into an educational event, right? No more just getting together for the sake of getting together and raising money, but we're actually gonna tell people what, it, what this is, right? And um, we created a formal program to go along with Juneteenth. And it involved um, creating an exhibit, that's the first thing we did, that outlined emancipation of former black enslaved people in Florida. We had a keynote speaker and we brought artists in, textile artists, food growers, a storyteller and singer, people who could also tell the story of emancipation through um, their craft. Um, and then, the, uh, what I decided to do was to tell people about the May 20th event at this Juneteenth activity. So the way we've been handling it since 2018 is we welcome people to our event, uh, our Juneteenth celebration, and we say, what is Juneteenth? Juneteenth is the day that the enslaved in Galveston, Texas were freed. But what we're going to do here today is talk about the date the Floridians who were enslaved were free. And we turned the whole thing into a May 20th conversation, educational event, um, and we still fundraise at the event, uh, but we do it on June 19th, because June 19th has, has uh, captured the, the season for celebrating emancipation in our community in Florida. So it's very hard for me to take it away I've been trying, I've been holding events on May 20th, and people still hold tight to that June 19th day. So that's the way we've been handling our Juneteenth activities. Lately, we would pull this program together and we would hold it at different sites. Uh, we would hold it at a local church or we'd hold it at a local community center, we'd hold it at the Spady Museum or we'd hold it at the public library. We'd travel it around each year in order to reach different audiences. Because we still have the, um, it's not a problem, it's a situation where of 
only a few people who have an interest in knowing about emancipation or people who really have an interest in celebrating the emancipation of the enslaved will attend. Everyone else, um, there's very little interest because we have such an eclectic community where we are. And in recent years, we've also coupled it with uh, music. Um, we've had a live concert, a live show, uh, in addition to our program. So we would bring in you know, professional artists to, to host a concert, and we use that event as a collaborative event. So we will collaborate with another organization in town, which is a presenting organization where we can hold the concert. But I just wanted to share that uh, a little bit of information about um, how we have, to, how we don't have to, but how we handle uh, the May 20th versus Juneteenth um, situation. And it's primarily because Juneteenth has uh, taken root in our, our community and it's very difficult for us to move people away from that date. What I did do was, as soon as the network started disseminating information about the May 20th celebration, uh, as opposed to the Juneteenth celebration, I copied my city commission on all of those documents and wrote a letter. And basically my letter said, even though June 19th is being recognized, as the emancipation date for black people in America who were enslaved, it is not the date for all black people. And I shared the uh, network's timeline, I explained em emancipation in Florida, and I sent that letter to all of my city commissioners. I do have a feeling that had we not taken a stand as the Black History Museum in Delray Beach were the only one, they probably would have followed suit with the other communities and made some sort of recognition of June 19th. Um, since I wrote that letter, they haven't done anything at all, and I think that I'm sure they are waiting for um, more direction on what the community would like to see done about uh, emancipation and the date that we celebrate. Um, so it is worthwhile for our organizations to stay, take a stand right there in our own communities and let our government officials know where we stand on this, what our thoughts are on this, because they're, in a lot of cases they're looking to us for guidance. And so we need to guide. Uh, the last thing that we're going to do, we're working right now with a local community, um, a community uh, play, playwright is to create a little play about watch night. Because once again, uh, most of the people that I talk to have no idea what that is, including the playwright herself. When I, we sat down and I said, I'd like you to write me something about watch night. And she said, what is that? So um, it's, a, it's, it's just constant education for us. Um, and taking a stand and leading the community in the right direction in terms of the history that we should be recognizing and the history that is being talked about right now. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. That was great. And I really love the way that you're using arts and culture too to um, communicate that message. And now we have um, Harriet Myers. Hi, my name is Harriet Myers. I'm from Fort Myers, Florida. Um, I'm uh, the treasurer of the Lee County Black History Society, and the Lee County Black History Society is the administrator for the Williams Academy Black History Museum. Uh, our Black History Museum um, opened in 2001. It's an addition to the first black school that was um, in Fort Myers that was funded by the, the government. Uh, the building was moved off of the site because it was going to be torn down and the Black History Society asked if we could uh, have the building and it was granted to us but we had to raise the funds to move the building which we did and then we got a grant to refurbish the building and we turned it into a museum and opened in 2001. My, um, and doing research for the emancipation uh, celebrations in Fort Myers I went back and found a newspaper article to find out that it was first celebrated in 1939 
uh, according to the Fort Myers News Press, and it was a big deal. They, they did a barbecue and a, a baseball game, and whites were, uh, attend, did attend that celebration, but of course, uh, it was during segregation time, so you had to provide a place for the whites to be separated from black people. Um, but it, uh, according to the news press, everybody had a great time. And then the next recording I, I found was in 1956 when um, a recreation center was built for the uh, black community, and it was celebrated on Emancipation Day in May. Uh, although um, it was never publicized, but when I was in school, which was segregated, we celebrated May Day. Now, didn't know what May Day was about. All we know that that was a day that it was a recreation day all day. We planted the maypole and all of that. And then after I became an adult and read up on May Day, found out that it was because of the emancipation. That's why we were celebrating. But then after the schools were integrated, you no longer heard about May Day. That was the end of May Day then. And um, until last year, Black History Society, uh, we always celebrated Juneteenth. But after um, getting the information from this organization about emancipation, and of course, you know, we were shut down, but the Black History Society did uh, an exhibit, a virtual exhibit, uh, concerning emancipation, and then we also did a, a, a discussion from three people asking them uh, what did emancipation mean to them, and then we posted it on our website and got pretty good reviews from it. Could have gotten more, but you know it is what it is. So we've decided um, since last year that uh, Black History Society will continue to to celebrate Emancipation Day. But we're also going to um, partner with another organization in the community for Juneteenth and um, to incorporate um, Emancipation Day with the uh, Juneteenth. Now, when we did celebrate Juneteenth, um, the Black History Society, the, we always read the proclamation to let people know about the emancipation and people would sit, because we, we were in a big park, so we always had our activities out in the park. And they would sit and, you know, some people would, well, you know, why are they reading that? So it, it tells us that our people really does not know about Emancipation Day. They just think that uh, Juneteenth is the day that uh, we should be celebrating. But, um, we, and as all of our uh, panelists here have said, we gotta educate our people on knowing what days that we should be celebrating as Florida, but not, not disregarding Juneteenth. Um, and now, since this, um, um, since the organization have, uh, have asked us to support the emancipation, our city government uh, did a, um, a resolution uh, claim, proclaiming May 20th as Freedom Day for the blacks. And it, they did the resolution, but they still um, passed an ordinance that Juneteenth will be a, a holiday for the uh, city of Fort Myers. Um, the, uh, oh, okay, the, the, and I did tell you that we're going to continue doing our celebration on May 20th, since last year was our first year. This year, this year in May, we'll be able to have people come in, hopefully, if no, no other uh, COVID viruses come out, uh, and we'll do a big celebration in the park, but we will uh, partner with another organization for June, on June 19th and try to incorporate with them on our May 20th. Still do June 19th, but to also talk about our Emancipation Day to try and educate our kids. Terrific, thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic. And we're gonna now go over to the other side of the room here. Um, so um, Tim, could you go ahead and launch us out? All right, I'll, I'll keep it simple. Um, and I wrote it down this time. Although Miami is, you know, was a fairly young city, 
uh, incorporated some 30 plus years after slavery, the documentation of slavery existed uh, in Miami. Today it's documented by the existence of, of Fort Dallas, uh, which was formerly uh, used as a slave quarters uh, and now sits in Loomis Park. Now Miami history is built on the fact that um, that Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Instagram all shut down on July 28th, 1896, <laughs> just as it did not, just as it did not work on January 1st, 1863. Uh, the message delayed or the dream deferred happened. In one instance, black, blacks had to help the young city to be born, and in the other instance, it created a staggered message of freedom for enslaved Africans across the United States. The importance of emancipation is not just when it happened, but it was uh, meant to, is, is what it meant to those who waited fervently for uh, the day to come. Now in Miami, so many people pushed for Juneteenth uh, to be celebrated. I had no idea what Juneteenth was, so I kind of got to Miami in a sense, but uh, I feel the meaning kind of gets lost due to the commercialization of the date and not the action. As black history becomes this new fad, this new, uh, the newest biggest thing for many people, um, you know, in the 70s, it wasn't cool to collect black history. That's when many of you began to collect yourselves because um, white people disregarded black history. But all of a sudden now in this new age, black history is so important that many of the larger PWI institutions are collecting black history. As gatekeepers and the ones that carry the message, we cannot allow the commercialization uh, to whitewash or change the state's history uh, as it, re, 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 as it uh, reference to this revisionist history of what uh, emancipation really was. We celebrate the freedom of te Texas, the enslaved blacks uh, being the last in Galveston, um, as the notification of the end of slavery. But um, that's sometimes not the story being told. Um, I, I remember with the Black Archives, we don't uh, celebrate Juneteenth. Uh, many people in Miami do, but that's something that's not on our books as a program that we do. And I got a call from the channel, the TV station. I can't get them to come out for anything, nothing else. But they wanted to come and, and stage us watching the signing of the, 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 um, the national holiday. And you know, I was like, wow, I can't get you guys to come over here for nothing else. But because you're telling me what you want me to celebrate, now you want to uh, come and cover us on the news watching the signing. Um, I said this earlier, but it was, it was a pioneer in Miami. Um, actually, actually uh, Dan Francis' wife, Sue Francis, that says she don't have to wear a daishiki to say that she's black. I mean, you don't have to tell me what to celebrate in order to be black. So it's not a Juneteenth versus May 20th thing. It's just making sure that the story being told that Juneteenth, Galveston, Texas, don't turn into Florida, you know, slaves being notified that they were free. Um, and it's up to us to tell that story. I have the saying that, uh, you know, you could tell a lie uh, so well that it gets to a point where you have to convince yourself that that was a lie, you know, that, you know, the lie wasn't the truth. So. We hope that we would carry that message of, of, of May 20th, what happened uh, here in Florida. And, uh, and thank you. I, I, she said two states. Um, Florida, as they have said, is three states, because once you cross that midway coming down, like she said, from Delray down, it's a whole nother story. Uh, good to see you, Jean Tinney, here, who holds a lot of uh, history out of Key West and what was happening with the um, slaves in Key West and things of that nature. But, um, that's just my take on, on the holiday, is that we make sure that we tell the whole story and make sure our children know what the story is as it relates to Florida and what it, what it is as it relates to, um, to, to Texas history. Because now that it's a national holiday, many people are not going to read the small script. They're just going to say, oh, oh, the slaves were freed on Juneteenth all across the United States. And uh, 20 years from now, that's what the story is going to be. But hopefully through this messaging, um, the, the correct information will be carried out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. And next up, we have Dan Sylvester. I said, I wasn't going to tell nobody but Vivian. <laughs> 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 I, I, I couldn't keep it to myself. I just couldn't. Yeah. I, I'm Dennis 
Sylvester. I'm from Mariana, Florida, uh, up there in the Panhandle. Right. A very suppressed area. Up in there with a Doja school and many, many prisons by design. And what we do is preservation work. We got a facility where we do cultural preservation, reforestation, uh, wildlife, wildlife management, and things like that. We got. We uh, started with 10 acres, then went to 40, then went to 96. In that area, everybody owns large plots of land. We never lived on a plantation or share crop. After slavery, I don't know how they did it, how they bought them large plots of land at $3 a day or whatever. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. And a lot of it has been lost and a lot of them has been preserved. In our area, we got the first black dairy in the state of Florida. The only black dairy, it's out of business now, but it was the only black dairy, the Granberries, had a dairy in, in Jackson County. At our school, we went from the first through the 12th grade, and we had on our campus one of the magnificent 12, they call it in Florida. That was a junior college that was uh, created to keep you from going to Chipola. Mm. It was 11 others, I don't know what counties they were in, but we had Jackson Junior College at our campus, and all the kids knew each other. Everybody knew each other, and you, those students at Jackson Junior College came from Monticello on back up. And the 24 May celebration would start with a whole day of activities. We always knew what the 24 May was because the older people would say, that was the day we got the news, boy. You know, they would, they would say that over and over, you know. They knew what the 24 May was. We didn't never have no doubt. So we will start that morning with activities. And like I told them this morning, we would take a team to Doja to play against those, uh, to participate in a track meet against those boys on the 24th of May. You should have seen those boys at Doja, clean cut, some as little as six years old. Clean cut, well mounted and everything. And they were working that farm. Those guys had never seen a live hog or a cow, you know. And it was just sad. There's two things that I remember that affected my life the most. It was November the 22nd, 1963, when Kennedy was killed and the day that our school closed. The day that Kennedy was killed, our teacher came out for recess. It was raining. And she said, President Kennedy just got killed. She was crying, man. And then everybody went to crying with her. By the time Martin and, and uh, John, not John, but Robert got killed, that blow was so heavy that it didn't even affect us that much. That was the only president we would sit down, we would sit on the floor with our parents and listen to Kennedy on radio, his, his entire speech. Okay, but after the day of uh, the 24 May activities was over, we go to the black church. Oh man, what a party. <laughs> they would come from all around, walking, man, walking, riding mules, and the ones that had cars would come down on cars, or trucks, or whatever. And they'd have all this food around, and it was just a big celebration. And that's the reason why I bought this syrup today, because we, pro we grow it and we process it. This is a, this is a product that's over 8,000 years old. They discovered it comes from New Guinea originally. It's a grass plant, but it has a high sugar content. And then they would come and we would have all these big vats of liquid and they would make syrup sweetened water. I don't know whether you ever heard of that. We did everything with syrup that was sweet. We made cakes and everything. And at the end of the day, everybody just take this food on. And in our area, I'm gonna tell you something, those people were unified, and that's what created a, a good people. You, you, you didn't never see nobody breaking in or nothing like that because you went to school with those people, you went to church with those teachers, 
And in my 11 years at that school, the school closed at 7 to 1 was mandatory integration. When that school closed, that was the worst day of our life in that community. When we were at that school, there was never a parent coming to that school talking about what you did to my child. If you went, if them children was in that school acting up like a bully or whatever, them teachers would break you off. They <laughs> wasn't playing with you. you. They didn't call your parents or nothing like that. Nobody never came for emergency, a medical emergency, a discipline problem, no sir. They, they didn't play, they came dressed like they were going to church. And when you left there, they had put, them, put as much as they could into you. Because they came from everywhere to the, to the Panhandle. They came from Jacksonville, South Carolina. They were recruiting those teachers to teach at those schools. And that was the best time we ever had, the 24th of May. It was better than Christmas. But that's the way it is. You got to just uh, remember your history. It's all about remembering. Those things that my granddaddy and my daddy did, every event around our farm was a big event. They served cooking, the hog killings. That was an event with a lot of people because a lot of those people didn't have the raw product. They would have to come there and help us to get them, you know. So it was just a way of life. Just always remember your history. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Danny. We love Danny's storytelling way of, of uh, putting history in context. Thank you so much. So now we're going to move on to Sandra Brooks. Hello, everybody. Well, I was just a few miles down the road from Danny in the Panhandle, also Tallahassee, Florida. But uh, my presentation today is going to take you also further south because I left Tallahassee back in six, 1969 when I started internship and I was sent to Pinellas County, had no idea where Pinellas County was, but um, that's where I ended up. And so I'm taking you both uh, going from one place to the other on well, what I have to say. Now, when I was growing up uh, in Tallahassee, we had sort of a dichotomy between city life and country life. And those of us who lived in the city really didn't know anything about May 20th. Uh, but my father did. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna, uh, and that's just the agenda, go to the next one. Okay, so I'm, t I'm telling it from a personalized basis here because I even included some of my family and myself in my presentation. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, my father lived uh, in a rural area, and the things that Danny just talked about were things that he mostly experienced and he loved. But we lived in the city. I grew up on Lafayette Street, West Lafayette Street, which is about two blocks from Florida State University. But I knew city life, I mean country life, because of my dad, and he's in the photo to my far left here, along with my grandmother and some cousins and my aunt, his sister. And uh, the pitch in the middle would be, you know how uh, you talk about going to grandmama's house? Well, in our family, everybody went to grandmama's house, especially after church. And that pitch in the middle, I think we were like, um, it was Easter Sunday and I'm the little girl standing in the back holding my baby sister there. And all of those others are my first cousins. And uh, we all knew each other and grew up together and uh, became very close, more like sisters and brothers. And then the buildings there, I, didn't, I couldn't find a picture of the farm and where my daddy planted his crops, similar to what daddy was talking about, and worked the land and all. But, I do have buildings that are representative of that area where he grew up. Uh, the one on the bottom was Robert's School, where he attended school in the early days, and the one above it was our family church, uh, St. Philip AME Church uh, here in Tallahassee. And 
the, I'm putting the buildings there because I don't have a picture of this place where my dad took me. And I went to this place and there were a lot of people there, a lot of food, there were games, and just some of speakers. And I enjoyed the food <laughs> and the games, but I didn't know why I was there. I didn't know what this was all about. Why are all these people here? And then I asked one of my aunts about it some years later, and she told me that was Freedom Day. That was uh, that we were celebrating emancipation. <coughs> this was my first knowledge of what May 20th was all about. This was a May 20th event that I attended. And as uh, I got older, I learned more about it, you know, talking to others and some reading. And um, so I'm gonna fast forward to 2011. And what happened as far when I became a member of the network, then I heard more about May 20th. And uh, I spoke with our director, uh, Mrs. Barnes, and we decided that we were going to try to get more exposure of May 20th to other people who lived in areas who had never heard of May 20th before. And we decided to start a Connecting the dots, and you may have heard Mrs. Bond use that phrase last night. A connecting the dots bus heritage bus tour, where we would uh, look at the different museums uh, coming from other directions, and have a heritage tour that would travel at various uh, museum and historical centers throughout the state of Florida. Now, I have, Mr. I have this house here, which is the L.B. Brown House in Bartow, Florida. Now, here I am living right across the bay in, in Clearwater, and I did not know anything about this house. And I discovered that it was built by a former slave. He became a millionaire. He actually had a safe in his house. And uh, he, was, he invented a lot of things, including umbrellas and other things. And Mr. Lewis is, is at this meeting uh, this week, Clifton Lewis, and he is the director of uh, the L.B. Brown House right there in Bartow. So we began our tour from Pinellas County, Clearwater, where our museum, the Pinellas County African History Museum, is headquartered. And our first stop on our uh, inaugural tour was at that L.B. Brown house. This house was so, so important historically now that the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture uh, sent representatives down to Bartow and they took two of the pillars that hold up this house back to Washington, D.C., and those pillars are now a part of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay. Now, over on the other side is the inaugural group. This, this is the first group of people who went on that bus tour, and they were from all different areas of Tampa Bay, uh, some from Brooksville, Florida, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Tampa, um, well, I'll think of some others. <laughs> uh, Spring Hill, <laughs> okay. And uh, we met at, um, at the Pinellas County African Mu Museum in Clearwater, boarded the bus, and then we set out for other areas. Now, I'm not going to show pictures of all of them, but maybe mention some of them. And I, I probably do have a few pictures. Go to the next slide, and that will bring back my mind. Okay. Uh, Harry just spoke about the uh, Williams Academy. So that's a picture of us in front of their museum in Fort Myers, Florida. And I uh, can't see that one on the other side. Oh, that's the Heritage House Museum in Bradenton, Florida. It is on the campus of, I think, the name of the University of Southwest University uh, in Bradenton. So we toured that museum. 
Next slide, please. Okay, all right. Oh, yes, that's Mrs. Barnes. <laughs> okay, now for this picture, we went to Punta Gorda, Florida, in Charlotte County. And at that time, Dr. Martha Barretta, who is the director there now, uh, was actually having a May 20th event in Punta Gorda. So the bus stopped there. Mrs. Barnes flew in from Tallahassee to be a part of the celebration. But she was also having the May 20th event enactment in Tallahassee the next day. So she came to this reenactment. Then she went back to, to, to Tallahassee for the uh, Tallahassee May 20th reenactment. You can see she was presented with this uh, special recognition. Uh, there was a young man who was um, doing a reenactment of uh, a legendary Air Force pilot. Uh, I think it's Lieutenant Charles Bell it should be on that flag. And uh, if you go to the next slide, I think that young man who did that reenactment, yes. And uh, there's a young man. He was barely out of high school, and he took on the characterization of this Lieutenant uh, Charles Bailey. Very good performance. Mm -hmm. The young lady with him, uh, that's uh, director of the Carter, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, African American History Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, then, <laughs> on the other side there, on our stop to, on our visit to Tallahassee, on one of the tours, we stopped in Greenville, Florida. What's Greenville recognition? Um, anyone knows a famous person? Richard Johnson. Yes, that's what he was, he raised there. And there's a park that has that statue of him in the park. And I took a little time there to get cozy with him in the park there. <laughs> and we did go to his home and visit there and tour. Uh, well, we, we couldn't go inside the house, but we could see the outside of it. Okay, next slide. All right. Now, the culmination of these uh, trips was always at the uh, Tallahassee where we participated in reenactment celebrations. Uh, of course, the one we hear a lot about, uh, General, General McCook, uh, and the steps of the Knott House Museum in Tallahassee, and uh, the cemetery uh, decoration of the Union soldiers, where you see Sergeant Major uh, Javier, Javis uh, Rozier there in uniform. And that middle picture is one of our reenactments. And I'm sorry to say that she did pass uh, earlier this year, Margaret Samar. And she would always uh, be in her uh, uh, period costumes. So, and this time she was portraying the role of uh, Sojourner Truth. And on the other side, I attended the uh, liberation of the Emancipation Ball. Uh, while, while we were there in Tallahassee for the May 20th celebrations, so all a part of our heritage tour. Okay. All right. Now what, as follow up uh, in, uh, to, so that my community in Clearwater would know more about May 20th, I be, belong to a group, it was a partnership between three uh, groups in Tallahassee, the House um, NAACP, an advocacy group called the uh, Clearwater Urban League Coalition, and um, in the museum itself, I know it's kind of African American History Museum, and we took it upon ourselves to educate our community on some African American history. And if you look at the last uh, list, the last item on the list was a Zoom presentation that I facilitated uh, to get the word out about May 20th and the importance of May 20th in Florida's history. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So now, 
in Brooksville for the first time in the Tampa Bay area that I know of, we are going to have a program in recognition of May 20th, which will be held in Brooksville, Florida. And uh, this is the Save the Date slide for that. Maybe uh, some of you would like to come and check us out. So now we're getting better at knowing, you know, and understanding things that have been left out of our history that, if, that we need to get into the books. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandra. And Mary, we've got Mary as the very last uh, presentation for today. So welcome, Mary Allen. Thank you so much. Good. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Mary Allen. I'm the executive director of the African American Museum of the Arts in Delano. Our first slide, please. Mm -hmm. The next one. The African American Museum was founded in 1994 by educator Irene D. Johnson and her beloved husband, Minister Maxwell. Next slide, please. Oh, just before I did forget to say that their purpose, their dream was to make the museum a facility dedicated mm -hmm. to multicultural artistic excellence and providing educational and cultural opportunities for the Central Florida community and its youth. Okay, that was their, one of their vision. Here you have Dr. Uh, Nobuthemen Watts, who was born and raised in the state, uh, in uh, the land, Florida, rather. Um, the next one, um, slide please. The next slide. Here is the Dr. Nobuthemen Watts Amphitheater. As I said before, he was born and raised in the city of the land, and he went on to be a well-known saxophonist throughout, throughout the country. And the amphitheater is going, to, is going to play a pivotal role in our education of the community on the Florida, uh, the Florida Emancipation Day, and also on the underst a better understanding of the Emancipation Proclamation that was issued by uh, President Abraham Lincoln. Next one, please. Here it says our 2021 virtual uh, emancipation celebration. This was our very first uh, event that we had. Um, in reference to our Emancipation Day in Florida. I myself did not know a lot about it myself because I did not learn about it until I became part of FAFN when I learned about May 20th uh, and um, Emancipation Day. So therefore, we got together, we asked our local historian, his name was Mike Brown, if he would join in the workshop with Sean King, who is the president of the NAACP West Volusia section, and also Dr. Primrose Cameron, who is an author and also a very active member of the West Volusia um, NAACP. So we came up with um, a group and we asked the community, uh, we want to know, what did you know about May 20th Emancipation Day? And also, what did you know in reference to the emancipation uh, that was given on June, June, uh, January 1st, 1863? And so as we began the conversation, we realized that they knew very little about that holiday. They knew very little about the date. Uh, they had never heard of May 20th before, 1865, Florida Emancipation Day, and they didn't have any information that they uh, knew about what was in the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation or what it was really about. <coughs> and so at that time, we said, oh my goodness, there's something that we knew that we needed to do and so and many of them also want to know, what else could we do? We want to know more about it. And so at that point, I knew as the African American Museum of the Arts, we needed to help them. We needed to educate them on, some of this, uh, on the information that they would need to help them better understand their own history. So what we did was there was uh, we got together with another organization, everybody is somebody, and we decided to, to do an annual Emancipation Problem a day. So we got together and we've already put together our 20, 2022 event. And so uh, that was one thing we said we could do. So let's go to this particular one here. 
Uh, here we have show a minute by our Looking Forward, our programs. So as Looking Forward, we decided that we're going to take all of our programs that we can use to talk about May 20th. So on this particular one, you see where it says Know Thyself Lecture Series. We have a Know Thyself Lecture Series every other month. We talk about different topics, African American history, anything that's pertaining to African American history and culture. So we said, okay, we can take No Doubt Self Lecture Series and add on Florida history so that we can uh, teach Florida history through our lecture series there. Also, we do a lot of cultural and historical film presentations. We have over 300 books in African American history, culture, we have films. We have DVDs, we have periodicals, we have magazines. So we could use that as another source of educating our community on their own on their history. Also, we have, um, we have added to our calendar of events an annual day, May 20th, 1865, Emancipation Day, that will now become part of our annual festivals. So we do three a year, we do Kwanzaa, we do the Noble, Dr. Noble Thinman Watts Jazz Fest. Now we can add May 20th, uh, May 20th 1865, Florida and, um, Emancipation Day. So we said that we can use as many of our programs as we can to educate the community about those days. Uh, the next one here says uh, visual arts. Again, uh, we have six or more exhibits a year. Okay, so we have exhibits, and we have exhibits on, on, on our culture, our history, our culture. We bring in speakers. Um, we have a partnership with Sesson University, which I forgot to mention before, where we bring in the speakers from Sesson University, and also we get, we get involved with them, Cookman University, with some of their program, and we join them in putting together some of our program, which I failed to mention before. Um, the next one is literary arts. Again, that is our local historian, Mike Brown. He does our lectures every other month. And we have a multicultural library for our children as well. And we also have an open mic session in the park. One of our board members is a poet, so therefore he incorporates uh, his poetry into our, our ideas and programs that we have there at the museum. The picture that you see there is from Stetson University. And that's where we brought in a young lady from, uh, she's from Tampa. She is a uh, artist and she talked about her culture as coming out of, uh, her parents were from Jamaica. And she talked about her, fam her family there, her culture, her mom and her culture there. And I forgot to mention prior to that, also we do focus on, on Caribbean art as well. We have about 500 artifacts from different countries and mass from different countries in Africa and the Caribbean island. Uh, is there one? Okay, of performing arts, um, Dr. Noble Thinman Watts Jazz Fest. We have it in two locations. We have one at the Dr. Noble Thinman Watts Amphitheater, which is gonna be crucial because we use that for many of our outdoor programs and reaching the public. Uh, Kwanzaa Celebration, we've been doing it for years now. Um, live character performance. We've had someone come in and do, uh, portray uh, Thurgood Marshall in, our, in the amphitheater. So a lot of our programs, a lot of our connection with the community is through the uh, Thin Man Watts Amphitheater. And let's see, is there another slide? Is there, no? okay, well, this is just part of our 500 artifacts that we have at the museum and they vary from, from Haitian art all the way down to art in Africa. One is from Ghana, a couple of pieces there. So we use all of this to educate you know, our, our community about what we do as the African American Museum of the Arts. So we are excited about that, and we hope to uh, really let inform the community about what we do and about their history and their culture. Because I've heard it say so many, said so many times today, we are the gatekeepers of our history. So if we don't tell it and tell it correctly, then it will not be told. So I see the African American Museum as one of the gatekeepers of our history. So therefore, uh, we know that what our role is to educate, educate, educate until they truly understand the value and the significance of Florida um, Emancipation Day and the impact that the Emancipation Proclamation had on our freedom as, uh, as enslaved African Americans.
Thank you so much. And let's have a round of applause for all of our panelists today. They were so fantastic. Thanks. So I want to thank you all because this is a lot to take in, right? And so I know that there are probably some questions out there. We do have um, some time left for questions. So is there anyone that would like to raise your hand, share? Um, I, I'll bring the mic to you. You could also introduce yourself before you say your, um, ask your question or do your sharing. Okay, I'm Sylvia Bird. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Sylvia Bird. I'm from Telling Us. And I'm here as a part of um, um, Ali, which is Austria, Austria Lifelong Learning Institute in Telling Us at Florida State University. But at any rate, I am amazed at how much education we have going on throughout the state through various uh, community groups, and it is really wonderful. But I do have one question. Do you foresee a day where there is a possibility that each of these organizations will have at least a platform of education that all of you do alike and then veer into your own individual local history kinds of things? And the reason I ask that is because we're talking, we're still talking Juneteenth, and we're still talking May 20th, and if we're, if it really matters to us that much to have May 20th, then we all need to, to go May 20th. I, I, I just, I just feel like it, it creates confusion when we still do two holidays or three holidays, and there's nothing wrong with it as long as we can come together and have a platform that says this is it from everybody. And that's not a criticism. It's a, it's a, it's a working toward, you know, getting the legislation done. I, I want to, first of all, um, say I understand your concern. But one of the things that I take to heart is the fact that African Americans are multifaceted folk who came from a multifaceted background. We didn't arrive here on one day. Uh, we didn't have our freedom announced on one day. We didn't do anything in terms of how we set the stage for who we are and how we got there. So I don't. I understand that this may be some confusing, but we're at the very beginning point of taking a hold of our history and getting the facts out. So I think there's growing to be done, but I don't ever see a one day kind of thing. I think I see a platform that may incorporate everything that we have here in an educational way, sort of way that sequentially puts it in, but I don't want to say that I ever see a day when we melt it down to something that we can just give. Here's something I wrote while I was sitting here, and I have to tell you all, I use the term white folks because it best defines where I'm coming from. So I don't want to offend anyone, but I just wrote, isn't it a shame we now have to prove to white people what they did, why they did, what they did, when they did it, and how they did it. We know why they did it. So what I'm saying is we are the victims of uh, enslaved folk. But who has to tell the story? Who has to dig up the evidence of, why they, of where they did it and when? We do. But we're, never, we're far from putting it succinctly into one place, one hour, one date, one time. We are doing the work. And we're the ones that weren't even given the, uh, 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 a way to read and write and document our own history. They did it. They did it inaccurately. They did it non-factually. And they did it to make themselves look better. We've got to dig through all that muck and mire and pull our history out and get the facts right. And that's what we're doing. That's what the consortium is doing. That's what the network is doing. That's what Altamese tries to push for. That's what each, every one of you here, I think, is trying to do. Be ye black or white. I, that, my, my whiteness has to do with the system as opposed to the person. I always say that because I'm going to say white. You might as well just hear me because I'm going to say it. But that's how I say it. 
because I just feel, I'm 83 years old. I am tired of going to seminars, being on panels, being at workshops, telling white people why they did it. I'm so sorry, but I'm tired of that now. I'm ready for you, for white folks to sit up and say, when you were walking past three white schools in the rain and snow to go to a black school, I was sitting upstairs looking down at you feeling really bad about that. I want somebody to say that. I haven't heard them say it. I'm tired of saying what I was doing down there. You put me down there. Uh, I, I, you didn't ask me for all of that, but I got wound up. I am so sorry. <laughs> but here, but it is important. All of this is important information, but we gotta tell it the way we can tell it. With what we got, we don't even have the money to tell it with. We're trying to still work out where the money is. It's our money, but we don't have it. So I'm gonna stop. I'm through. Thank you. <laughs> My only comment is that I just, I'm, I'm really appreciate your truth telling, and just. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Yeah. I, I would just say history um, is history. So, you know, when I tell the story, for example, of St. Augustine, I'm not caught up in Juneteenth or any other dates except for telling the history because I operate a history museum. And it's a local narrative that we tell that has national impact. And those are the stories that we will continue to tell because if we don't tell the true stories, then another story will keep being perpetuated over time. So, you know, it's a little bit different, um, our story. It doesn't mean that we don't embrace May 20th or Juneteenth, you know, as I said, we participated in a Juneteenth um, celebration this year, but for the first time. But our museum doesn't do that kind of stuff. We do history. And then we do some other cultural stuff, but we don't participate in a lot of the current social kind of things that people do because, first of all, we don't have the bandwidth to do it. <laughs> We're so small. But um, our focus has been the history because the history has been buried, as Mrs. Fowler is saying, for so long. It's not that it hasn't been recorded because if it wasn't recorded, we wouldn't be able to go and dig it out. But it has not been promoted. And part of our mission is to promote and perpetuate that history so that the next generation doesn't have to do what we're all doing here is digging through you know, all kinds of archives and stuff to find out what really happened way back when. Thank you so much. Do you want one more comment? I just want to say one quick comment in uh, response to your question. I do see us all using conferences and gatherings that, that we go to to collect the history and have a universal message, tell the, the whole universal story. But I don't see us all sharing that story in the same way. And I don't even see us all sharing that story because sometimes it doesn't apply to us. Um, as we, so I guess a question. Um, as we do more conferences, as we have more meetings, as we create and craft more stories from different perspectives of African Americans, as we figure out what, not figure out, as we tell more people about the true history we know is true, have the evidence to prove is true, what, after telling the stories, what active path forward can we emphasize to people besides just telling stories? On that same note, um, I don't know, just bring it up because there's no other panel I'd bring it up to. If reparations in some way, shape, or form was a conversation, how would that ever look? You know, I'm not saying we need to go through and definitely say, oh, you were a slave, here's money. No, but I am saying we can actively look at our country, see how there's issues in the entire poor working class, then also see that even in that working class, poor blacks have, not poor blacks, blacks in general, have an entire caste system that is affecting them. Is there like an active path forward to trying to fix the issues that have occurred thanks to the history that we know is true, have taught everyone else is true, um, and are trying to work against. Is reparations in the form of like a universal basic income a thing? Is the form of giving cheaper land to people we know are descendants of slaves an option? Or is it just we teach enough people, we vote enough, and eventually things are made in a way that helps us all? I'm not sure what the active um, path forward is past, just making sure enough people know that black people have been screwed over for a very long time and are continuing continuing to be screwed over, that the 13th Amendment makes slavery still real in our country. That racism is very real, so that's my, does that make sense? <laughs>
Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, response? Well, the, wor the word you said just well over is a word I don't use, so I can't use that word to tell you on it. But here's what I'm going to say. <laughs> the way we do it is through the system that did it to us. So the system that incarcerates our young men and women, the system that has taken our land from us, the system that is now taking our vote away again, the system that is doing all of that is still drawing and taking away from us. If we are allowed the equal opportunity, real equal, to do what we deserve to do because we are Americans, we will be, we can receive, not, we are ever, never gonna get what the United States owes us because we are the United States. We built the buildings, we brought the uh, economy, raising things over, we brought carpentry, we brought all that, we already know all that. But for heaven's sakes, let us be equally treated through the system. Now let me say to you, the system has to start at the bottom. If in your county and if in your city, the system is wrong, get to the meetings. Help change the system. If they say, oh, we've done it that way, well, we're not doing it that way anymore. And this is why, and this is how we're going to do it from the bottom up. So here's what you say, defund the police department, fix the police department. If you take away the money from the police department, the people who are the ill ones, the mental health ones, they're going to take that money away first. Go into that police department, get rid of those that are no good, and then put some policies in that recognizes the fact that all black people walking the street don't have to be arrested and go to jail. You. you know, go to the system. I, I'm just so system oriented. I go to the meetings. I've been to the meetings for over 50 years, and I still go, but when I walk in the meetings, they know I'm there. So that's what you're going to have to do. Uh, we, we have a whole conference full of work, workshops coming out of this room. Next question. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you all for a, a great presentation. Um, yeah, just a couple things, and, and um, I think the questions and comments that were made just kind of add to um, maybe what I'd like to ask about or comment on. Um, I think one of the, um, I, I would say concerns, uh, and I, I've shared this with um, my dear friend, uh, Alchemy Barnes and others, um, is that so much of the discussion is sort of getting framed as either or. Do we do May 20th or June 19th? Well, uh, both are valid. The, 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 re, the basic meaning of Juneteenth, as we all know, and, and, and the beauty of it is that we're getting back to that because I can remember friends in Texas and other places who knew about Juneteenth who just disparaged it because they thought it was just another day to get drunk and cook barbecue, as they would put it. But it, it, it was, uh, it's kind of been reborn that the basic message is until all of us are free, none of us is free. So that wherever emancipations happened prior to that is very meaningful, obviously, and, I, and I'm, I'm so glad that I'm here to see May 20th getting the kind of recognition it deserves. But that doesn't mean that it's better or more appropriate to, to observe than June 19th. Um, so it seems that if we really go back to our traditional knowledge, and I think that kind of addresses some of, you know, what you were just saying about the path forward and you know how we deal with the system in place. Um, the system in place was based on colonizers having everything to teach us and nothing to learn from us, and we know that the only reason we were brought here was because we knew what we knew, and you know, they didn't, and it had help, that's, you know. But, um, so we really have to do proactive things like what we're doing now. And when we really think about it, uh, we look at our traditional science and so forth, every day of the year is important. Every anniversary is important because in our tradition, you know, Time is not a linear thing, it's a cyclical thing, and you know, every anniversary is a you know, cosmic, you know, rep rhythmic repetition of cosmic alignments and all of that, and we're connected. So I think if we really think inclusively, connecting all the dots, which goes back to, again, our, our tradition, then we start really looking at even more opportunities that are not you know, either or. For example, um, 
May 19th, it's almost been forgotten. May 19th is the birthday of Malcolm X. After he was assassinated, a, a good part of the country, it's almost forgotten now, celebrated that as Black Sardar Solidarity Day. It kind of sort of got supplanted by African Liberation Day, which was the last Saturday in May. But when we really think about it, that date, May 20th, May 20th is also the national day in Cameroon. There are a lot more African Americans in this country with ancestry in Cameroon than anybody might think because that country, for whatever reason, was getting a pass. Um, people were not recognizing how engaged those folk were in the human trafficking. So what we really have is an opportunity to make the most of these days. Why not have uh, Emancipation Day in Florida also includes somewhere in there a recognition of what Malcolm X brought to us. Uh, why not connect that to what's happening in Cameroon? Why not do that with every, every day? Because you go to Yoruba land today, the, all these festivals, all these recognitions of ancestors are linked to every day that people know of because those dates connect us to everything that happened before and everything that will happen. And as we reclaim and revive our traditional knowledge, that is very much the path forward from, from, from what we're doing. So I, I think we should take heart from the fact that we're gathered here, having this conversation, learning from just all these folks right here in Florida. Uh, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just so enriched from just being here today. Um, and uh, that too, I think, will, will be part of our path forward. I don't know if anybody wants to come in. Thank you so much. One come, anyone want to come in from the panelists? I would just like to say that, um, you know, it was a lot of what you just said, but I think one of the things that's happening that it's not really reparations, but being in the museum business as we are now, we know that a lot more funding is opening up for African American yeah. museums. Yeah. And I think that we have to be mindful and kind of stay on top of that and make sure that it doesn't go to other entities that haven't traditionally told the African-American narrative. Yeah. Um, I see that happening as a whole nother issue that's cropping up now. And I think that, um, but there are opportunities that have not always been there, you know, through uh, major funders for African-American history and culture. And I think we take advantage of that so that we can continue to do educational programs like this one and ones that we do um, throughout our museums all over and, and other museums like us across the country um, and educational institutions are taking advantage of that. Hello, um, my name is Ruben Acosta. Um, I work with the uh, Division of Historical Resources over at the Department of State. I want to say that I was fascinated by all of your presentations. It made me really excited um, to learn about how you all have been celebrating this important holiday that I only learned about when I moved here to the state of Florida uh, five years ago um, and how you're using it to promote knowledge and such. And I wanted to share that I think that there's an opportunity there um, through our office at the Bureau of Historic Preservation. I, I specifically am responsible for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's the official designation program for places um, in the state of Florida as a national level program. And um, we have been working very hard to try to identify, recognize, and promote African American places in the state of Florida within the last several years. And um, I know that many of you are in historic districts or operate out of historic places, um, some of which have very recent nominations that reflect the history as we are trying to tell it now. Uh, some places may have recognition, but that recognition is dated because it was done 30, 40, even 50 years ago. The historic designation program started in 1966. Um, and I think that as part of your Emancipation Day celebrations and in your general missions as museums and educators and, and promoters of African American history, um, I would encourage you to reach out to our office. I would like to connect with you. Um, 
so that you can be involved in the production of this history that's being done, the formal writing down of this history that is then used by so many other agencies of government, uh, by other educators, by promoters that you can you know, give and share with your local governments, with your nonprofit organizations, with your business councils and such, so that you can disseminate this information and those stories that you have to tell. Um, like right now, I, I, just thinking about it, we've got various projects. We've got a survey in Jackson County that we're doing that's being funded by money from the federal government because of the Hurricane Michael that, you know, to yeah. go out and just find out what is out there because Jackson County hasn't been surveyed in 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, we're working on a National Register nomination for McCollum Hall in Fort Myers, which is a historic African-American um, business building, which is very similar to the Wright Building oh. in DeLand that yes. we recently listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, we're doing an update for Lincolnville Historic District because that nomination is 20 years old and needs to have new information done. Um, and I think that not just doing you know, those current projects that we have, but in your celebrations, encouraging people to come in and document their stories and recording them and writing them down or putting them on audio and stuff. You have so many great opportunities there. I'm really excited um, because you're doing important, important work in establishing the firm foundations for moving forwards and telling your stories and, and not just the factual stuff but the interpretation and explaining why these things are important. So, um, you thank you. Huh? What was your email oh, I have my business card, so if you come here, I've got a stack that's tall so I can give out as many as you want. And make sure you tell Ruben what you want, all these historians that are in the room, and we think we have one last comment over here. Good afternoon, I know we're about to leave, but really my comment was, um, especially since this gentleman is here, one of the things I'm learning uh, is that really this state is pretty much behind and needs to catch up on um, how it has, has mishandled the African American story. So for example, I'm from Pensacola, Florida, and very recently we renamed our museum because it was named after a man who was a Klansman, uh, you know. And uh, because of that, he was a collector. They eventually named the museum after him, which meant, which meant of course, he didn't collect us. I see my right? intern already got so some shoes. So I, I think see. while we track Thank you. what can go on the, the, the National Register, I'm um, here, Ms. Diane is at the Chappie James Museum. And everybody here knows who Daniel Chappie James is, but the museum is just like three years old. What oh, took yeah. so long, right? So um, I think it's the responsibility of preservationists and um, historians and council, like I'm, I'm on Pensacola City Council, and council people to uh, make sure that we call our government to task on its neglect. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everybody for being in the room today. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you again for the panel. Another round of applause for the panel. Appreciate you. Thank you for your, your time.